Hello, everybody, and welcome to the grand finale, the final event of the 2022 MotorOne.com Star Awards. I am Seth Mirsma, Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com and Inside EVs. Um, joining me tonight is an all-star cast of uh, editors from MotorOne.com, and, and I'm super excited, you guys. I, I know you are all, too. We've, we've, uh, if, if uh, all of you have been paying attention to, to the site this week or any of our social media, you've seen that we've been announcing winners to all of our categories of, of the Star Awards. It's been super fun. We've gotten great feedback. Um, we had a ton of time putting this together, a really good time putting this together this year. And um, this is this is an awesome way to, to end, uh, to, to cap off the event. So um, joining us uh, this time are, we've got Mr. Chris Smith and Mr. Chris Bruce uh, from a lot of you probably will have seen or listened to the Rambling About uh, uh, Cars podcast. And they're gonna be emceeing a little bit for us today as we go through the, the, some of our very favorite cars from the Star Awards. And in, you know, towards the top of the hour, we're gonna tell you which one was our very favorite and one editor choice this year. So um, I should probably, I, we already talked about this, thank once again, our sponsor, uh, the E-Range EV Tires. Um, fantastic to have a sponsor for Star Awards this year. And we're really happy to have uh, E-Range EV Tires as the sponsor. Uh, the all-new E-Range EV is a tire specifically engineered for electric vehicles. Using an advanced manufacturing process called liquid phase mixing, E-Range EV's EcoPoint 3 technology creates a tire with lower rolling resistance and longer range while offering low levels of wear and high grip. All this while staying affordable. You guys can check it out. Go to erangetires.com. That's E-R-A-N-G-E tires.com to find your EV's next set of tires. Please don't go right now. Why don't you wait for another hour <laughs> and go and check that out? And in the meantime, uh, I'll throw it to Smith to, to introduce us and get us rolling. Well, usually this is about the time where I'm saying today on rambling about cars, but no, this is Star Awards Editor's Choice. And this is a very, very cool time right now. We do have pretty much everybody you can imagine. We've got Senior Editor Jeff Perez. We've got Senior Editor Brett Evans. Of course, we have... Editor-in-Chief Seth Mearsma. We have Managing Editor Brandon Turkis. We have my co-host Bruce. We're going to have a really good time. We've got an hour to talk about some amazing cars. Of course, we're going to stretch this. I mean, we have to keep you around for a while, right? So we're going to, we'll announce the winner at the end. But before we get there, uh, Seth, why don't you explain a little bit just how we got to this process? How did we decide these cars? Just, yeah, tell us, tell us how it comes out, man. Yeah, so so for most of Star Awards, uh, for for all of the regular categories, um, and, well, let me step back. For all of the cars that we invite to Star Awards every year, we pick the cars that scored the highest in our in our star rating system throughout the year. Then we break those down by category, and we award winners in performance, electric, uh, truck, SUV, and value. And did I say performance? I'm forgetting one. I I only hit five. Performance, value, luxury. luxury. Yeah. There you go. Luxury. How can I, I forget luxury? There. That's okay. That's okay. So, um, and and in doing that, so we, we've got um, cars that really rate out really well. We invite those all for in-person testing. Um, then we do a little bit more scoring. We have a lot of conversation about which one we, ones we like the best after we do head-to-head -head drives of all of the categories and we pick a winner. Um, it's not quite that easy for Editor's Choice. So Editor's Choice kind of evolved last year in the in the uh, very first Star Awards from sort of the conversation around which car everybody wanted to drive the most uh, while, while we were at Test Week, while we were, uh, I should say, I wasn't there. Well, while, while these gentlemen were at Test Week uh, and, and doing performing the first testing. Um, this year, there was more debate. There was a lot more conversation about what car we wanted to have. So we thought a little bit and, and you know, kind of figured kind of, sorry, we started to have a, a bit of the conversation around what car we would want to have, you know, for the rest of the year. If you were to drive something away from Star Wars and take it back to your house, what would be the thing that you would want to have and why? What fits into your life, um, but also really brings you a lot of joy and um, then did a little, a little bit of voting based on that. So what we're going to talk about now is there are 20 cards involved in Star Awards. We're going to talk about the five that we like the very most for Editor's Choice and, of course, finish on the one that um, will win the accolade this year. So very exciting. Very good. How about, how about we just jump right into it here? Because 
I have a feeling once we get talking, it's going to get pretty interesting because um, just a little background. I was the one that tallied all of the votes for editor's choice and it was not easy. <laughs> There, it's surprised there are a lot of varying opinions on here, but I mean, it all came together really great. So, um, the first car on our list we're going to talk about that was a finalist here, the Acura Integra. Who wants to uh, who wants to go first? Jeff Perez, I'm going to shoot it over to you. Oh, um, me. What, what was I'm what gonna... was your take for the Acura Integra here? Um, hey, Jeff, can I interrupt you quickly though? Yes. I Go ahead. Because I just I just want to make sure that we let everybody know that this is an audience participation. Podcast, oh yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so thank we you, are, Seth. We are live. Yeah. No. 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 That's okay. So so we are live uh, right now. If you guys are watching us on MotorOne.com or InsideEVs.com, you can leave us a. Uh, uh, well, you you'll be watching us there. If you're watching us on social media on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, leave us a comment. We will see that comment in real time. Ask us a question. Uh, we'd love to have extend the conversation to you all. Yes. We can throw those up on the screen and answer um, as we're talking about the different cars. Sorry to interrupt, Jeff, let's talk Integra. Yes, go for it. <laughs> well, I think it's funny you threw to me first uh, because the Integra was uh, not high on my list. And I, I don't say that because it's a bad car at all. Um, I just think that something about the Integra to me, I think it was a great, it's a great sporty little luxury car. Um, it obviously drives really well based on the, the Civic SI platform. Um, but I really didn't like fall in love with this car. I would actually say that Brett, uh, out of all of us, fell in love with this car the most. And I see why. I totally understand. It is uh, reasonably affordable, great to drive, and it's, it's really nice. But I think Brett would probably have a lot more nice things to say about the Integra. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. This is this is probably my number one vote getter in terms of the editor's choice award because uh, it just does. It, it would fit really well into my life, and I know that that's an incredibly personal thing, incredibly subjective thing. But that's kind of what the editor's choice was all about: was what car do you want to take home and have in your driveway for two years? And it kind of it kind of earned that spot for me by um, having really really solidly decent fuel economy, pretty comfortable front row tons and tons of cargo space and a big practical hatchback which, which was kind of awesome and then um and then it also was just a kick in the pants to drive it was so much fun to to uh has a the world's best manual transmission i'm pretty sure i can say that without a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of pushback the turbo engine is really fun and kind of sassy and then it's got a limited slip differential and um, and uh, adaptive dampers to really kind of let you have a really good time on a twisty road so um I, I just kind of it kind of like takes all of my personal boxes in terms of being really fun to drive, really um, efficient and economical, like something like 36 or 37 miles per gallon on the highway, uh, tons of cargo space, lots of things that I like that I value because I, I kind of, you know, I enjoy throwing stuff in the car and going on a long drive. But then at the same time, so much fun and just such a brilliant, delightful little hot hatch. Um, so that's kind of why I threw most of my chips behind the Acura Integra to win this award. Definitely understanding that there are a lot of other amazing vehicles in our competition. All right, Brandon, how about, uh, how about you chime in here? Yeah, you're going to hear a dog barking in the background. That's because my wife is about to walk in the door. So forgive me for that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really adore the Integra. It kind of reminds me of the original, um, a, not original, the first in the U S Audi a three, and that it is a, affordable very fun to drive very well equipped car that looks quite good um you know i i've kind of felt like cars like the cla class and god dog just cool it um <laughs> the cla class and the bmw 2 series grand coupe are just a little bit stodgy a little bit you know trying to be like their bigger brothers um and and the integra is very much comfortable in its own skin it's it's okay that it's a affordable car. It's it's focused on being fun. Brett's absolutely right. The manual transmission on it is fantastic. Um, the cabin is really well done. But the thing for me that really highlights it above the Civic Si, which it is very similar to, is the extra equipment that you get in in the Integra. You're talking about adaptive dampers. You're talking about a slightly larger instrument cluster. You're talking about heated seats, which is for me living in Michigan is an absolute must. Um, I really, I, I pushed for the Integra in editor's choice. I pushed for it in best value. I think it's a very interesting car and it's, it's far 
far more interesting than than I thought it would be when I first saw it uh, when it debuted earlier this year. It's it's a great effort on Acura's part. Well, Seth, I think that just leaves you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that Brandon uh, kind of hit it on the head. The, the thing that stood out to me, and actually this was interesting, right? Because we had uh, Brandon mentioned that th- this car received a lot of attention and a lot of consideration for our best value award, right? And I actually pushed back on that pretty hard because the Honda Civic SI um, essentially offers the same sort of mechanical package, the same fun to drive, uh, essentially, but for less money, right? Um, but I, I will say that over the course of time, like I, I've, I've seen a lot more merit in the, um, the idea that this is a really great value as a, a car that splits the difference between sort of sport performance and luxury, right? If you really want all of those things in equal measure, um, you're getting a lot of each one of those for around, you know, under $33,000, $34,000, something like that, right? We're, we're not talking about a lot of the cars that we had were, were double this uh, much money. And a lot of the cars that we're going to talk about tonight were quite a bit more expensive than, than the Integra. So it really is a very balanced package uh, for somebody who cares a lot about enthusiastic driving. Um, and yeah, I echo what the rest of the guys say. Fantastic world-class manual transmission, um, really light, precise handling, a punchy engine. It doesn't really overwhelm you in any one area, but it never really lets you down either. So um, I think it's really impressive. And I am personally, like, obviously this would uh, go more towards when we do this again next year, but I'm really excited to see how Acura evolves this platform because we do know that more is coming from Integra and and we think it's going to be, There's- um, you know, a lot better. <laughs> there's a great, there's a great comment asking about that. I was just going to mention it and ask Brett to talk a little about a little bit about the Type S because he's the only one that's actually driven that and kind of builds on what Seth was just saying. Yeah, Acura, Acura had me out um, in uh, in Japan and I got to drive the Type S for literally three minutes on their test track. So it really wasn't <laughs> enough to really get like a get like a great drive version of the vehicle. But you know, 300 plus horsepower, manual transmission only. It's still going to be front wheel drive. Still going to have that fantastic limited slip diff. Um, it's going to be, I mean, anyone's complained about the Integra until now. First of all, they probably haven't actually driven one. They probably just see 200 horsepower in the spec chart and decide that it's not worth thinking about. That's not fair to the Integra. It's a great car regardless of the spec chart. But for anyone who really does think that way, the Type S is going to solve all of those problems and that. And so um, it's going to be much more, um, much sharper and much more precise and much more, um, a little bit harder edged without being as um, immature as the Civic Type R. It's going to be a little bit more up, up market and have kind of a nicer interior and feel a little bit more, um, more of like a luxury product, a sport luxury product. And it's going to be great. I mean, uh, this, this person who commented, Antoine Lee Thomas on Facebook, you're absolutely right. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, I think I don't I, I don't want to sound like I'm too lukewarm on the Integra, although I think I am maybe out of all of us. But to me, that Type S is going to be probably perfect, like more power, probably a little bit better handling, like maybe a few more features. Like to me, I'm, I'm really excited about the Type S, even if I wasn't super you know jazzed about the base Integra. So it's a great platform. Like there's just more there, in my opinion. But uh, yeah. Well, Jeff, let me ask you a little bit more on that. Um, I mean, is that really what's kind of holding you back on the Integra right now? Is this wanting a little more oomph from it? A little bit. I mean, there's some more stuff to it. I think some of the other cars that we have here uh, in Editor's Choice and that we had out on performance do a little bit more for me. And I'm, and we'll talk about those, you know, in a couple of minutes. But yeah, it, it just it didn't really speak to me too much. I think it is a great car, but I think I need a little bit more. Uh, I think at that price point too, I, I probably need a little bit more. So, but that's just me. Okay. No, Hey, that's a fair argument. And I mean, we are talking about a vehicle that did not win the award. So, um, obviously great vehicle, not the, not the choice for everybody. Uh, just want to shoot a quick reminder. If you're watching us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, motor1.com, inside EVs, all these places, you can drop comments. We'll see your comments. We'll try to work them in as best we can. We do have a lot to talk about. Um, And on that note, let's jump over to the second vehicle. And I believe that is going to be the Audi RS3. And let's see, let's toss it over to you, Brandon. What do you say? You should probably unmute your mic before you talk, though. I should probably unmute my mic before I talk. 
Thank you for that. Um, the, the, the guys will probably laugh. I was kind of, I was kind of the Audi RS threes champion during, during this entire week. Um, I just, as an overall package, it is, it is a vehicle that, that suits my lifestyle perfectly. Uh, it is very comfortable and very refined and very composed in everyday driving, but it's also just capable of lighting your hair on fire on a twisty road. Um, it's it's a hoot to drive. It sounds fantastic. It's 401 horsepower, um, a five cylinder turbocharged engine that sounds excellent. A, a really great seven speed dual clutch transmission, uh, adaptive dampers. I mean, the, the only weak point in this entire car is that the steering is pretty lifeless. But once you get beyond that, I mean, it has it has a trick rear differential that makes it feel like a rear wheel drive car. You can drift this thing. You can really fling it around as, as Seth, I'm sure will say you can overdrive it. It is extremely tolerant of, of just, just beating on it. Um, yeah. I, and I love the way it looks, especially in, in Kyle, I green. And this is, this is a no cost color. Like you can get that color for free. So yeah, there's, there's not really anything about the RS three that like doesn't suit my personal lifestyle. I really, really like it. I think that, even though our car, the, our test car that we had at test week was seventy five thousand dollars, you can get a very good one of these for sixty three or sixty four, and I know that's a lot of money, but it, it is genuinely performance bargain. You're going to be getting to sixty in under four seconds, which is just wild. Um, yeah, I, I adore it. I absolutely adore that car. I think I sort of fell in like with the RS3, and like you said, seventy five grand is kind of hard to parse for a really small car um on the track it's phenomenal like i really really walked away from our time on the track in the rs3 thinking it was going to be my runaway performance pick even with all the good cars that we had there um then you drive it on the road and to brandon's point the steering is a little lifeless and it kind of a lot doesn't, a lot lifeless a lot I, lifeless i, I, I don't think you need to pull any punches there <laughs> Well, it kind of doesn't respond to the rest of the car, like for as sharp and as quick and as good as it is. Um, but I could totally see myself owning one of these two. Maybe not in that color. Um, I don't know if I'd want to walk out of my building and see that screaming green car in my parking lot every day. Yes, uh, how dare you? Think, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is a car that I could see myself owning. I want to say it was my second or third choice of the whole group for editor's choice. And I, I really like this thing. So I think you should got you guys should explain what lifeless steering means to our audience because I think a lot of them haven't necessarily <laughs> yeah, driven a car on the track because it was my and... biggest problem with the car. <laughs> okay, so, go for it, man. So um I'm not I I am not a great I shouldn't say this out loud. I'm not great at sussing out steering feel. Um like as a rule, it's just not it's not like my thing that I like fall in love with the car over. Some people are like, "Oh, it's got perfect steering feel." I'm not that person. So when a car is as bad steering wise as the RS3 is, and I notice it, that's, that's, that's when you know you have a problem. It's just that you don't get any feedback through the wheel at all when you are driving either on track or on the road as to what the front wheels are about to do. So like, it'd be great if you had a little bit of notice that you were maybe going to understeer a little bit through a corner and you needed to scrub off some speed before that happened. And the RS3 doesn't really give you that. It compensates for that with that fantastic rear differential that really just kind of like routes power to the outside rear wheel and helps you ease the understeer before you really have to like deal with it in the first place. But um, for people who really like feeling very connected to the road, the RS3 is a great choice in every respect except for the steering. So that would probably be the biggest problem that I had with it. Um, and it's kind of why I never really warmed to that car. Um, it was it was phenomenal. I can't argue with anything that Jeff or Brandon said. I love I love the interior styling. I love the exterior. The color was cool. It drives great. It sounds great. It just didn't really float my boat in a huge way. Um, but that, otherwise, I completely agree with everything that everyone else is saying about this car. It's it's fantastic and it's a great value. It, like uh, even at seventy five k, or you can get a nice one for sixty five or sixty seven. It's a fantastic performance value. I I think the thing that really like kind of saves the RS three for me is that the chassis is so good and you're so aware of like how the car is moving around underneath you as you're going around on the track that it kind of makes up for the fact that the steering doesn't really tell you a lot. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think of like the best way to like 
explain what lifeless steering is and it, I, I really have nothing. It's it's one of those things like you have to get out there and experience it. But the way the the chassis talks to you, the way that you can kind of feel right in like the bottoms of your of of your body, like how the car is moving and how it's responding to your inputs, especially under braking. This thing moves around really beautifully under braking. You can add steering well hard on the brakes, and it's it's very controllable. Uh, it's it's just it's uncanny for a car that is essentially you know, a, 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 a premium economy car in its base form. It's, it's really a hoot. Yeah. Steph, I, we're, I, we're going I, over to you I, here. Yeah. Well, quickly, I want to, uh, we, we shouted him out in the comments, but I want to say hi to our great friend, Tom Malogny, uh, senior editor at Inside EVs, uh, who's, who's showing up at state of charge there, Tom. Yes. As, as, uh, super producer Kyle said, stick around. There are definitely going to be EVs involved in this, uh, but great to have you watching along. Um, I am not going to go down the rabbit hole of, of, of steering feel versus precision versus steering experience because, um, as most of you know, I can, we could do the rest of the hour on just that. But I will say this, like, I don't... Um, I really like the RS3. The RS3 wouldn't have been my pick for editor or is what, you know, didn't, didn't get a lot of my, my uh, votes for editor's choice simply because I think it's a fantastic car in the canyons and on the track. I do think, you know, I echo what everybody else has said. I think that it, it balances sort of livability with really supercar. Like, like I was looking this up before the podcast Brandon said under four seconds, but I think like some of the magazines out there got this. I think we, we tested we, it. Our, our testing wasn't involved, but we had it right around four seconds. Some of the magazines we had got a, it considerably lower, like, like three and a half or below that. We had um, it at three, nine and I've seen people saying like three, 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 four, like it's like, really yeah. wild on a dusty unprepped surface. We were able to do it in three, nine. That's pretty amazing. Right. Yeah, yeah, properly supercar fast or what would have passed for supercar fast even just a few years ago in a car that, again, you can have basically everything that you need for under 70, even though the one that we had was 75. Personally, I don't think that it would, it wasn't the car that spoke to me the very most in terms of like how I would use it day in and day out. But but if I were in the lucky position of having the keys to this for a year or more, I would drive the hell out of it, right? So really a fantastic all around pick and and, you know, again, like we're going to talk about five cars overall tonight. All of them, every single one of them is a car that I think um, I would love to have and would love to drive a lot more. Um, the RS3 just falls into the very caffeinated uh, uh, sort of hyper-focused end of that spectrum. So very good. Uh, Dom, <laughs> Dominic weighing insane. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I'm, I'm probably stealing your thunder. Yeah, but but you know what? The the <laughs> the Audi won't fall apart after a thousand miles. So there's We're, that. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dominic uh, is part of the Inside EVs crew and he's he's a friend of Motor One as well. So slower than Tesla Model 3 performance. Oh. Here That's we true. go. Here we go. We're going to get into, we'll get into some EVs here a little bit later. Bruce, uh, you've been kind of <laughs> quiet up there in the upper left of Hollywood squares. You want to, you want to take us into the next one? I haven't been that quiet. I asked the question about, uh, you know, what you said, steering you, feel no, was like, question. but it's here. I will go next. So the next vehicle on our list is the Hyundai Elantra N. Um, Smith, I know you tabulated the votes, so I can't say how many votes this vehicle got, but it's kind of it, it comes up dead in the middle of our ranking. Every so. just about everything on this list. I, there were multiple tiebreakers. We'll we'll just put it that way. Um, okay, okay. Brett, why don't you why don't you talk to us a little bit about the Elantra N? Well, I was gonna say Jeff. We haven't heard much from Jeff tonight. Well, Jeff Jeff let us off, right? I guess. I'll tell you what. Well, let's put you guys in a ring and fight. <laughs> Go. <laughs> we gotta have some drama here. Everybody's like agreeing with everybody. How about this? Because in, in my opinion, the steering feel on this car is phenomenal. And I want Brett to sort of explain why this is better than the RS3. <laughs> I think that's fair. That's a good argument. Go for it, Brett. It's your turn, man. Sure, why not? So so Hyundai N is doing incredible things. They I don't think dynamically speaking, they've missed a step yet. You know, like the Veloster N was absolutely brilliant. And there were a few little problems with it um, in terms of like interior quality and seat comfort and stuff like that. But, but dynamically, it's brilliant. The Elantra N came next. 
uh, in the United States at least. And it too is just absolutely phenomenal. And they've really done, Hyundai has done an incredible job of making a 276 horsepower front drive sedan be so incredibly well balanced in, in any dynamic situation. So, um, and somehow they've done it without giving this thing crazy amounts of torque steer or understeer when you're going through a corner. It just sticks and goes and asks for more. It's just, it's so much fun. And, and you know, Jeff kind of alluded to it a little bit that uh, it really does, it feels much more connected to the road that you might expect given uh, the fact that it's front drive or the fact that it's a Hyundai or whatever, whatever prejudice you might have against this car, you can throw it out because it is just, it's so incredibly brilliant. Um, it, it was the polar opposite in terms of, I voted for this one pretty heavily too. And it was kind of the polar opposite in terms of like the Acura Integra in that it's overwhelmed with power. It's got incredible grip. It's so brilliant to drive, um, but it kind of falls apart a little bit on the road. It's got kind of a harsh ride. The trunk isn't great. You know, there's a few things that, that hold it back, but the interior is lousy. The interior is probably lousy. probably the worst in our test this year, probably the worst cabin in the test. So, uh, but it was, you know, other than that, it, it, if you, if you can look past those things, it was brilliant. Jeff, I want you to tell me more about how much you love it because I know we, we kind of got in cahoots together about this one for best performance car. Yeah, um, I, I walked away from the track testing and I had RS3 number one. Maybe not a runaway, like I said, but it was definitely higher than, than Elantra N for me, just based on the chassis and, and the engine and everything. And then we take these on the canyons and the RS3 kind of didn't do it for me on the canyons with the steering, whereas the Elantra N like felt perfect. It just felt like such a dynamic, good road car and it to brett's point like tons of power not a lot of torque steer that dct is is really good you don't really miss the manual especially hyundai manual because i think they're kind of not great especially in the veloster n um but yeah it is harsh the interior is a little plasticky but i really really love this car and i think you can get it for what about 35 grand uh to start so it's an amazing deal. It's an amazing car. And I think Hyundai is just absolutely killing it with all the end stuff. And now you can even get, you know, the Kona N, which is also great, the little SUV. So it's, it was hard for me not to absolutely just fall in love with this car and make it my number one. Um, but there were, there were a few things that kind of held it back. So. Well, I mean, you're not alone on the assessment. Uh, we're getting some comments here. Uh, let me just put this one up here. Uh, Alfredo Productions. This really shows that you don't need an abundance of horsepower to have fun. I have heard that a lot about the Elantra N. Um, I haven't had a chance to drive it yet, so I'm a little jealous of you guys that have. But, I, yeah, I, mean, I think this is, a, I think this is a, a great case, right? Well, I, I agree with that. I agree with Alfredo 100%. I will say, though, you know, we are in – we're – very spoiled these days in terms of horsepower, right? Because we're talking about, you know, this is a, you know, a two liter turbo making 276 horsepower, right? And what is it, 280 or something like that, pound feet of torque. Um, very controllable power to like very, you know, uh, great linear power delivery, kind of everything that you would want out of a, a sport compact, hot hatch sort of style car. But to the point that you guys have all been making, like, phenomenally controlled um really fun to drive too like it never felt dead it didn't really understeer on the track in a way that you would have expected from a couple generations uh ago sport compacts right um so the thing was really tossable i actually i love this car on the on the track specifically because i expected it to behave a little bit more like a traditional again you know um performance based front wheel drive car but it was it was wild. <laughs> I mean, when you really when you really uh, drive this car hard, it's very loose, but in a fun way. You can still control it. Um, it doesn't feel overly buttoned up. It doesn't feel boring. Um, it's it it can be really precise, but you can also um, you know sort of slide it all around if you want to. So, uh, as a performance car, I think it's fantastic. I think for me, for editor's choice, it was a tough. For you know, everybody keeps harping on the cabin. I, I was making the argument, I think, all week long that, yeah, the cabin is not as nice as most everything else that we had there. But I think that Hyundai spent the money on the right stuff for a performance car like this, right? Yeah, the wheel is great. Sure. The seats are phenomenal. The touch points that you're using uh, when you're driving the car all make sense. 
Um, it looks pretty cool. It's just you're beyond that. Everything else, it felt feels like they had to pull their budget out of the creature comforts and instead uh, put it into the things that really matter. If I'm doing it, if I'm the product developer for for this uh, the Elantra N, I would do it exact the exact same way because you know Jeff made the point earlier. I think this I think it starts actually around like thirty three, a little like a tick under thirty three thousand dollars. Not with the DCT and not necessarily as as we drove it, but that's amazing. Like that these days, um, when when cars are are well over forty thousand dollars on average, like you're getting an awful lot for that. So the the value goes a long way here. Any last looks like, thoughts? Looks like we. Oh, sorry. To, I was just going to say it looks like we have a, a an old friend of the family also <laughs> weighing in. On the, yeah, I was I was going to go on, there on Hyundai and yeah. Mr. Dude. Mr. John Neff joins us to say the end sounds wonderful, but it looks a little too boy racer for me. Just a preference, though. John, the it's because you're old. Really the sound is what's kind of most captivating <laughs> about that car. Like, if you could drive it with your eyes closed, you'd be a much happier person because it sounds <laughs> so, so good. It's brilliant. It, it just, it's so snarly and crack. It sounds like an old Fiat Abarth, like a 500 Abarth, just snarling and crackling and all kinds of fun. Um, but it, yeah, I can't get past that mask. I'm not a huge fan. I've seen it. I've it's, seen it body color, like aftermarket body color, and I think it looks a lot better. See, right? I, yeah. I I really love it. I I I I'm the I think I'm the only one in the group that like actually likes the way the Elantra N looks. I mean, it, no, I recognize it. I'm it's with a you. Face only. It's a face only a mother could love, but like I like that. I I don't think that a sport compact like this needs to necessarily look conventionally attractive. I think it can look a little wild. I think it can be. A little abrasive in its design um and in my opinion the elantra and like walks the line just perfectly and I'm, I'm with you i'm with you and everybody here knows how much i hate large grills and for some reason hyundai just seems to do it right and we them, so. we did we didn't even get the good color we got we got white that's boring as hell we didn't get the performance blue <laughs> the white this car and, this car I mean... this car in performance blue looks amazing Performance blue looks great. Some of the other colors don't work super well with this car. I think I drove no, a, a red, a dark red would be blue bad. one. Red yeah. would be bad. Yeah. I, I don't love this design. I don't love that wing at all. That looks awful. I think that's one of the first Ooh. things I would do if I bought this car. I, I would take wing. that wing off. Oh, man. I, I, the wing is great. Oh, the wing man. is great. I like, like there are two, like, I like there are like <laughs> two like howitzer barrels under the bumper. Like it, it it's great. I, I love everything about it. It's it's a good design. Jeff, you're wrong. That's the what is the yeah, what is the Korean before. equivalent? Where's the Korean equivalent of Pet Boys? <laughs> oh boy, I'm not I'm not touching that one. That's that's where this wing came from. 100. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's yeah. functional. I'm sure it's delivering downforce at a speed that I usually can't achieve. I'm not going to beat up on the launcher looks anymore because I actually do think it's a pretty spectacular car all the way around. But yeah, polarizing I, looks. I think we can all agree to that for sure. I will. I will acknowledge. I think like a ducktail or duckbill spoiler on that would look pretty there great. Like that would yeah. that would look pretty sweet. <laughs> John Neff comments: Target demo for the design, sixteen to twenty-three year old boys. I love this. I'm 48. <laughs> yeah. You have the heart of a 16 year old though. Let's be honest. This, this is, this is true. This is true. Gary Clark has a great question that actually refers to how the thing drives. And yes, the end grin shift is the stupidest name for the coolest feature on the car. Um, it gives you a little overboost. So I think you get some extra horsepower for 10 or 15 seconds at a time. Uh, and it is hilarious when you, when you, when you do the NGS end grin shift, either going out of corners or like coming away. Like if you're doing a launch control launch, it's hilarious how different it makes the car feel. And maybe it's just a psychosomatic thing, but it's brilliant. It's a lot of fun. I did, I did want to mention, like, I think Brett, you mentioned that it, it doesn't really torque steer despite the amount of power that it has. And I feel like that's the case because it's actually really, it feels really lethargic off the line, like relative, to like similar cars, like a well, Golf R also... or a Civic Type R. I mean, you launch this thing and it's like, Am I doing this right? It it, it felt really kind of just lazy off the line. Your your first like five or ten feet definitely feel a little torque limited. Yeah, and like, then the, then the boost comes in. in, and yeah. And I don't think it's a boost thing. I think it's literally like torque. I think it's I think it's torque limiting just to like protect the half shafts or whatever. I don't know. I'm I'm talking talking uh, out of a part of my body that you can't see right now. So uh, I'm not totally positive. If that's what that yes. yes is the word. Well, let me, <laughs> let me just say that we've talked quite a bit on Elantra N 
Um, I think that's very telling for the uh, kind of vehicle it is. We should probably move on to our next vehicle. Bruce, do you have that one pulled up for us? Or do I, do I don't have it pulled up. That would be a Kyle thing, but I do know what it is. Okay, we, we, know, be, we know what it is. Yes, and that would be the Cadillac CT5V Blackwing. Oh, man, Brett's go. got two thumbs up for this Whoa, thing. Oh, two thumbs up. It's very blue. Very, very blue. Brett, why is this a two thumbs up car? I want I want Seth to tell you about this car because he spent so much time behind yeah. the wheel on the track and he like pretty much got this thing down perfect. So Seth I, I know I know part of this story and yeah, Seth, you need to you need to tell us about it here. So I, first of all, let's just like let's let's regroup on what this car is because there are, there are a number of different uh, CT5s that Cadillac makes. This is the one just in case anybody is confused. The the CT5 B, V Blackwing is very important because under the hood it has a supercharged 6.2 liter V8 and it makes damn near 700 horsepower. It's what 668 horsepower and like 659 pound feet of torque. Um, the one that we had had a critically important feature for a sports sedan, and that is a six-speed manual transmission. Um, that though it wasn't quite as good as the Honda Acura transmissions that we also had on hand, it was pretty fun and actually like a lot more forgiving. For the actual track work um than than you would expect it's great on the road on the road you'd have like there, I, I really have no issues with it whatsoever it's not quite as butter, buttery smooth as again the honda one but it's pretty amazing um this car makes all the right sounds it drives the right wheels uh in my mind it is ferocious um attacking like any corner again like road or certainly if you have a if you have a track available um you start to realize the mechanical grip available is incredible partially because you know you've got this it, these days like super sophisticated uh magnetic dampers that the overall suspension uh tuning and chassis tuning has been done has been done exceptionally well um so there's this great range in the car we talked about it a little bit um with the rs3 and i think it's also the case of the cadillac that this the the black thing really spans the gap between comfortable but really aggressive on-road driving to just completely balls to the wall track driving in a way that's that's uh very impressive i had a ton of fun with it because um because it was so frankly it was so intimidating like i, I think you guys would probably agree like this was the most intimidating car on the track for us um bar not like not not just in the performance category but of everything that we drove and it's it was really difficult to get it right we were out at willow springs we were on the um the sort of middle distance track. It's about two miles, a track called Streets of Willow. Um, an, an awesome track with great elevation change um, and a few turns that are a little bit tricky to get right, especially in a car that has tons of power um, and is driving the rear wheels. And it was just sort of halfway through the day, the intimidation factor wore off. You started to get into the groove of the car and really trust it. And when you trust it and you understand what it's going to do, you realize like, Hey, despite the fact that it's got this crazy power, it's incredibly predictable. It really just d does what, um, you know, you, you sort of start to understand like what, what the car wants to do. And then you're just going quicker and quicker every time you turn a lap. So um, in terms of the track work, that was great. I also, I really um, voted pretty strongly for this for editor's choice because I, because of the thing that I just talked about, right? Like it's still a big roomy sedan. It's still pretty comfortable. It is not class leading in terms of luxury cars, in terms of the infotainment and stuff like that, but it still has really good tech. It has a really good sound system. Um, you know, it's it's a car that, at least I think Brandon could probably ha has a different story. I don't think all of us were equally comfortable in it, but for me, it was really comfortable. And I could see it fitting really easily into my life with, you know, it has the room to put kids in it, has got a decent sized trunk and things like that. So there's some practical considerations as long as you're not tallying up the price and the amount of money that you're spending on gas. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think Cadillac has done some spectacular stuff here. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm widely known on the staff as, as the, the resident Cadillac critic. Um, and I, I think the CT5 V Blackwing is genuinely an excellent performance car. Um, I think it's it's the kind of car that if you and I, and I wrote this in our our best performance car post if it's a car that you find an E63 AMG or a BMW M5 a little bit too comfortable a little bit too too aloof like this is really the vehicle for you um 
Seth is right. I struggled to really get comfortable in this thing. I don't love the seating position. Um, I, I always feel, and I felt this way about the CTSV in the past. I've always felt really cramped in it. I've never been able to settle into a good seating position. Um, I don't love the six speed manual. I, it feels old and like a carryover, but I will say the thing that I really appreciate about this is the performance traction management system which is also found on the Corvette Z06 and it makes this car, it's, it's a huge part of what makes this car so accessible. You can precisely dial in the amount of assistance you want from the electronic nannies and it makes hustling it around the track a really, a process of exploring. You're, you can adjust this system and it changes how the car, you know, steps in and helps you out. And, but it does so in a very transparent way. You're not constantly aware that, oh, you know, I only made it around this turn straight because the nannies stepped in and helped. It felt like, oh, no, I did that properly. Like, that that was all me. It is it is such an ego boost and is a huge part of why I like this car so much. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, it was not a, a car that I really rooted for. It was not a car that I, I particularly, like, expected much of coming into this test, but... By the end of by the end of our week at at in California, this is the car that I drove chose to drive back to LAX. Like I I really kind of it changed my opinion about about the CT5 V as a whole. And yeah, I I was very pleasantly surprised. Even the even though it's not a vehicle for me, I'd rather have an E63 or I'd rather have an M5. I very much respect what Cadillac did with this car. I think it kind of plays a similar similar role as uh, like the Elantra N on like a on like a more expensive scale um, because it starts at somewhere in the 80s fully loaded this one was uh, like 115 or something like that but you can't one, really 123 get an M5. 123, 123. Okay. so so the M5 starts at 110 and it goes up from there like there's if you get an M5 with any amount of options you're at 120 if you want an M5 that can even come close to rivaling this thing in terms of performance you're into 130 or 140 so, you know, this kind of like plays the, if you can call a $120,000 car value, this car plays the value play a little bit in that you get such an involving and thrilling driving experience for a lot less than you'd spend on that E63 or that M5. But this, the downside there is that you get uh, not nearly as nice of interior quality and you do kind of miss out on some of the, uh, like, it doesn't, it doesn't blend in, which it, it doesn't blend in at all. This is a very shouty and loud car and it's, there's nothing like, sleek or urbane about it even slightly so you know you you definitely make some sacrifices by not having to pay as much but i kind of agree with seth this was my other like you know these three those three cars the the blackwing the elantra and the acura were my top choices just because this one is so darn involving and thrilling yeah oh here's a comment from john neff why is this car such a critic's favorite? I stand by my long-term opinion. Cadillac is wasting time and money on sedans, no matter how good they are. Um, it, it it can be both a critic's favorite and be a waste of time and money. Well, uh, and, and, I, and what about John? Those two things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> and and is John aware that they've already sold every single one of them? I don't know that yeah. that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Jeff, we Wait. we really we really interrupted you here. Well, I'll say that this car is a critic's favorite because it has a supercharged V8 and a manual transmission. Wrong or right, yeah. this is why we like yeah. it, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> and I think John is right, long term, for Cadillac, that who cares about sedans. Um, I, I'm going to be the critic of the group, or the cynic of the group, unfortunately. This car just, to me, any car that you can't fully enjoy on a public road within legal limits is kind of dumb. And that includes the Hellcat. That includes any SUV with more than 500 horsepower. And that includes this car. On the track, to Seth's point, you really have to know what you're doing and you really have to get it right for it to be really re rewarding. Otherwise, it's kind of scary um, and it's kind of intimidating. And I think for a lot of people, for me and for Brandon, like something like an M5CS, right? Or an E63 will be so much more fun. You get in. You go around the track super fast. You don't think too hard about it. You don't worry about driving up up, up the side of the mountain. Like, I think that's that's where I'm at personally. That said, uh, the the fact that a car like this exists at all is insane, right? And the fact that Cadillac took 
the CT5, which, you know, in base form is not a great car, and turned it into this is ridiculous. And they kept the manual, manual transmission. So I understand why it's here. I understand why so many people love this thing. It's just not a car that I really rooted heavily for, unfortunately. But, hey, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on it, it being – I don't think intimidating is the right word because, well, you know, I was out lapping this thing and the, the sense that I got, after, especially after I got comfortable with it and it started like tweaking like the, the PTM system is that it is, it has limits that I, I cannot reach. And the car is very transparent about saying like, you're never going to reach these limits. You're not good enough. But I never, ever thought that, you know what, if I go through that corner at two more miles an hour, this car is going to bite me. I never felt like I was in that situation where it's like, this car is going to turn on me. It is, it is absolutely does not have my back. You know, the entire time that I was driving it, it felt like this is a partner. This is a car that like I can work with that I can explore and that it will very much tolerate what I'm doing. Even if what I'm doing is is not necessarily right. Um, I, I think that's a, that's really a credit to the design, uh, the engineering work that uh, that Cadillac and GM did. That it is it is so tolerant of people that may not necessarily be you know Formula One drivers. It's 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 an accessible car um, if you're willing to get out there and explore it and treat it with the respect that it deserves. Sure. Yeah. I, I, and even on the road, even on the road, it does feel like accessible like you're not too intimidated driving it just in normal conditions or driving it relatively quickly like in that in in that respect i do agree with you there and and i think you're right jeff like in i i agree like it's um this is not a car that you can explore the performance like the the outer edges of the performance on a public road for sure you're absolutely paying for capability that you're not able to use day to day unless you are taking it to a track and let's be honest most people are not not taking most cars to track let alone their hundred plus thousand dollar Cadillac. Um, so, so I think that's a fair criticism. I would, I would say that, um, that that's probably true of even, even cars like the Elantra. And I don't think that you're really getting all of the performance out of the car when you're on a public road, unless you're just a completely, uh, insane person. Right. But, yeah. um, well, I just, I'm, one thing on the Cadillac, cause I, one thing we talked about this a little bit when we were all together in California too, and it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? One of the knocks on this car when we were talking about a performance, and I think it's been in the conversation too, when we were talking about it for editor's choices is the CT5 V Blackwing moving the needle forward, right? Like what this card is not, they're not uh, probably a whole host of new patents that had to be registered to create this car. We're not talking about a brand new powertrain. I mean, it's, it's an amazing engine, a hand built engine or whatever exactly that means in GM parlance, but it's, it's a special car. Um, it's got, you know, Magna ride uh, that, that is an incredibly well tuned system, but not anything that's new. Um, I just think like, and, and, you know, we've all written this or edited stories over the course of the last couple of years where we're talking about sort of, is this the last great ice car for this brand or for this nameplate, right? And, and I definitely think that this, this car falls into that too, where you, you, I look at it and I'm like, not only is this a special car, because there probably won't be a whole lot like this wearing a Cadillac badge going over the next, you know, 20 years, 10 years, or even five years, um, but it's also a special synthesis of some of the best work that engineers at, at General Motors and Cadillac have done over a long period of time brought together in a package that makes a ton of sense, right? So there's a little bit of a, you know, it's, while it is absolutely not a needle mover, and I think that the car that we're about to talk about next, spoiler alert, we're almost there, is much more of a needle mover, which is why it won out over this. Um, it is still, uh, it's it's a really happy sort of tip top of the pyramid of the work that that again like GM Performance has done over over a long time, and I think that's special, and I think that's worthy of recognition for sure, and a fun car to drive in the process. So, very good, gentlemen. Well, I, we are almost to that time, so before we jump to the final car here on the list, before we jump to the Editor's Choice Award for the 2022 Motor One Star Awards. Here's your chance. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, <laughs> wherever you're catching, we're going to chat for just a minute or two. Toss in a comment. What do you think is going to be the winner of the Motor One Editor's Choice Awards? Gentlemen, 
you know, you know, you all know the winner right now. If there was, a, if there was a second car that you wanted that you wanted up there instead, what would it be? Let's let's start with you, Jeff. Well, of the group, I think RS3 was my second car as as far as something I want to get in and drive all the time, something I would live with, you know, be happy with for a long time. Um, I think RS3 was was up there as my second car. Okay, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, one that we didn't even talk about, uh, but the Range Rover. I'm, I'm, I'm. Of, of, of course. Of uh, course Chris, Range Chris Bruce is muted, so we didn't hear him say. <laughs> of course, of course, it's the <laughs> <Yes>. Range Rover. <laughs> I was muted, and I did did yell into my mic. Of course, it is. <laughs> of course, it's the Range Rover. Brad, how about you? Um, it would probably either be the Integra because I absolutely love that thing, uh, or the Maverick. I think the Maverick would be a really easy vehicle to live with on a day-to-day basis, and I really, I loved, I loved everything about driving that thing, uh, except maybe that I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do much off-roading in it, and that's kind of a bummer. But yeah, either the Integra or the Maverick would be a very happy second car alongside our winner. Okay, and Seth, how often do you go off-roading, Brett? Uh, like once a month, maybe find my way. Find is that intentional or on purpose? He, he lives in California. They have like off-roading trails in their backyard. It's really oh, okay. There. Okay. Seth. Man, I don't know. This is a really hard question because of this group, right? Like, I mean, I think my heart says the black wing. I, I just love driving it so much. My head and a little bit of my heart actually, uh, says the, um, the, the Lightning, the Ford F-150 Lightning is such a, I mean, it, it would be tough for me to have a truck all the time, but if it was, if it not, not even an EV, that's the funny part, right? Like the, the EV part of the Lightning, I think is, is phenomenal, really easy to live with and incredibly compelling. My problem is a little bit more, I have this, I have this uh, sort of structural block with having a pickup truck be a primary vehicle, because I think you're kind of, these guys all heard this diatribe on it, but uh, you're essentially wasting you know, kind of 40% of the, the vehicle the entire time you're driving it, unless you have something in the pickup bed. All that being said, it's such a flexible vehicle. It's so comfortable to drive and quiet, um, easy to use. And again, with, with a lot of range and power, that one, that one might be uh, number two for me. It, it would be a tough fight though. It's, it's, it's sort of the pinnacle of ice versus um, one of the new stars of, of EV. Okay. Well, very good. Very good. want to thank everybody for commenting. Uh, we'll just do a quick run through here. We've got um, in the comments, BMW iX, M5 CS, uh, Subaru WRX. Bruce, I'm going to toss it over to you. What? Why don't you go ahead and uh, and do the honors here? What is the 2022 Motor One Star Awards Editor's Choice Vehicle? I'm going to do my best mouth drum roll. <laughs> the Hyundai Ionic 5. Hyundai our- Ionic 5. Woo! All right. Now we need the EV Mafia back in here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Tom and, yeah, where was the uh, gallery at? Tom Malagny. <laughs> T- think, t- time think, to give him a call. Time to get all all of the EV people back in here. Um, I, I, Jeff, I think Jeff, all of our 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 EV our inside EVs friends may have uh, lost patience with us as we were essentially uh, regaling them with a lot of <laughs> dinosaur juice burning performance cars. Uh, oh, how they dare we! Surprised. They don't want to yeah, hear about yeah. the Blackwing. <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not. But um, Listen, yeah, let's, let's talk about EVs the real winner. Loves the Blackwing. They love six point four V8. Let's talk about the. Re- Ouch. fans. Jeff, lead us yeah. off with Ionic 5. Hyundai Ionic 5. Um, it's one of those cars that I think when it debuted initially online and when we got to see it in person for the first time, I think we were all kind of amazed just stylistically. Like the 8-bit lighting and the, the really squared off design and the really funky bumpers. Like Hyundai went fully bold with this car. And in the same way they kind of did with the Elantra, even though I think that was less successful, they went all out in styling this thing. And that's the first thing you notice. Like even in our, we had a, we had a huge driveway in front of our house that we rented out for this. And when you walk out the first, maybe the first thing you see is the Hummer because it's ridiculous. But then you look (laughs) around and I think the Ionic 5 was maybe like the next car where you're like, okay, this one stands out to me. It's got a really good color. I don't know this color off the top of my head. I don't remember what it's digital called. Digital teal. Digital teal. Digital That's teal. right. Okay. Ooh, I like digital the name teal. Too. 
Yeah, good name. It's got those funky silver bumpers. And then you get in it and uh, it just feels so, it feels futuristic, but not in a way that's like unattainable, right? Where some cars try so hard to make it feel feel futuristic that you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know what this is. And the Hummer, I think had that, that issue for me. Um, but you get in here and it's just clean. It's nice. It's futuristic. And then you drive it and it is just so delightful. It's not like the sportiest car in the world. It is decently quick. It's not super fast, but it just feels so, so nice to drive. It's a car that I legitimately want to buy. I think I had a few cars. If you listen to the rambling about cars podcast episode I was on where I talk about how many stupid cars I want to buy. Um, I think this is now on that list of cars I would, I would consider buying. But it's not a stupid car. It's actually a car that makes no, a great deal a good of sense. Car. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Brandon. I was about to chime well, in. Well, no, I mean, yeah. like that. I mean, I'm I'm in the same boat as as Jeff. Like this this is a car that my wife and I are actively considering for our next vehicle, which we're buying in a, about a year from now. Um, it it makes a lot of sense. the The charging is incredibly quick for the for the price tag. I mean, you don't see vehicles with 800 volt architectures that can charge at like 240 kilowatts for forty five thousand dollars i mean this this one is loaded it's 58 but you know what you can get the the same dual motor layout and uh i don't remember exactly how large the battery is but the same size battery pack for like forty eight thousand dollars um the range is is super adequate the performance is great it was getting to 16 about four and a half seconds in our testing um it's just it's such a great overall package it's got Really cool features like V2L charging so that you can use it at like a tailgate or like if you lose power or whatever to like run things in, in your house. Um, and it just looks amazing. I love the, the design of this car. Like it is, in my opinion, probably one of the best cars that's come out in the past 10 years. Best looking cars that's come out in the past 10 years. It just it just looks epic. And I, I think the digital teal is kind of a boring shade. Like it still looks great. I'll say too, I yeah, think I'm... someone mentioned, sorry, I think someone mentioned EV6 earlier, um, which is basically the, the same car in a Kia yeah. form. And I, we, we were sort of torn because we wanted to invite both of them. But I think the Ionic 5 just stylistically and, and some of the other features, like it was the one that we well, really wanted there for the awards. That, that's the thing. I think you can, and I, I considered writing this in when I was talking about it in our editor's choice post, which is I, I literally have queued up right now and I'm about to hit publish on. Um, you know, we, this, this, this award is for the Ionic 5. It could very easily be construed as an award for Hyundai in general because this, this same fundamental vehicle is available as a Kia. It is available as a Genesis. It is available in so many different flavors and so many different powertrain varieties and price points. I mean, it's, it's really amazing that you can get one of these for $40,000 as a Hyundai or $70,000 as a Genesis or $60,000 as a Kia. And it's going to look unique and feel unique in every different iteration. It's, it's really just, just a triumph, honestly. Yeah, so, I think real, that oh. every oh, go ahead, Bruce. You, so I I just had a question. I want to play devil's advocate as our audience here because I have not driven any of these vehicles, so, so I'm putting that out there. You guys voted the Ford F one hundred and fifty Lightning as our best truck. You guys voted the Ford F one hundred and fifty Lightning as our best EV, but yet our editor's choice is the Hyundai Ionic five, which is an EV. It's not necessarily a truck, but it it kind of bleeds that line sort of into a crossover. So why is it better than a lightning that won two of the awards this year? I, I think so. That's actually a great question. Cause you just teed me up for part of what I wanted to say. Anyways, one thing is like this car has, you know, as, as uh, they like to say a lot of eyeball, right? Like we're all talking about styling first. We've got, you know, again, like our friend uh, Tom Longy weighing in on style. Everybody is talking about how great the car looks. I actually don't even, I, I don't love this design as much as everybody else does for sure. I think that it's cool. I think it's striking. I had a conversation. A lot of the photos that you guys are looking at right now were from a fantastic photographer uh, named Logan Zilmer, who was out shooting with us. He was saying that this was uh, one of his very favorite cars to shoot the entire time that we were out there, right? Um, it's eye-catching. It's something that people will will notice, but it's not 
over the top. Like it's not, um, it's not sort of scary design, right? So I think number one is that it's, it's attractive in a way that maybe the F-150, the F-150 was important for both truck and EV, especially for EV, because um, we actually really believe that it's got the biggest opportunity to change the most minds about electric vehicles in the segment that matters the most, right? So like the, the conversation about it being the best truck and the conversation about it being the best EV really dovetailed into one and uh, dovetailed into each other. In terms of editor's, editor's choice, where we're talking about like, what is a car that we would want to take home? What would we want to live with for a significant period of time? It sort of starts with what you're seeing. And then it goes into a lot of the stuff that Brandon was listing, right? Like it's really useful. It's a great size and shape. It's really great to drive. Um, it does all of this stuff that people who are specifically honing in on wanting to own an EV, like charging quickly and having adequate range. It does those things really, really well too. So across the board, circa 2022, this is just a vehicle that like checks an awful lot of boxes for an awful lot of people, not to mention the boring stuff like, you know, you can put a lot of groceries in it, right? Like you can, it's, it's still whether you want to call it, I, I know like some of our competitors call it an SUV. We, we tend to think of it as kind of a hatchback. It doesn't really matter, right? It's a, it's a big boxy open shape that you can put a lot of stuff in, whether that stuff is people or things. Um, and so I actually think that it was a really good fit um, and kind of the perfect choice this year for Editor's Choice because of all those things. Just kind of got the total package right now. Very good. Very good. Any last thoughts? Really John, John has the most important one too, price. Price is critical. Price. Like I, I hammer on this all the time. It's cheaper than the than the Lightning. It's it's not an inexpensive uh, electric or inexpensive vehicle, but it's inexpensive for an you, electric vehicle. You can get an Ionic Five with all wheel drive, heated seats that gets to sixty in four and a half seconds and recharges from like ten to eighty percent in in like eighteen minutes for like forty seven thousand dollars. That's that's nuts. That is absolutely nuts. That's yeah, that's 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 it. I mean, Greg Greg brought up a good point too because so we also had the Lucid Air GT there um, for testing, and I, although it didn't win any awards, we really really liked that car. But I think what we noticed when when driving it was even though it has a glass roof and it's really like glass heavy and just in terms of you know window size and and frameless windows and stuff like that, like it felt really claustrophobic to drive. And I think at night, the reflection was was pretty bad. I kind of really didn't like how bad the reflection was. That's definitely something that Lucid, I think, is aware of and they're going to they're gonna look at. But when I got in the Ionic 5, it felt so comfortable, just space-wise and visibility. And I, I can't think of a car that I've driven recently or even with, within the year that felt as just nice to sit in and look out of it other than the ionic five i think the seats could maybe be a little better but other than that i i loved really driving that car well and it's really it's really flexible in that respect because it has a sliding second row so if you need a lot of leg room in the back you can do that if you need cargo room you can do that my favorite feature though that i haven't seen on anything for, like period maybe at all is the sliding uh center console for the front seats you can have it all the way forward and have like a kind of like a full console style with an armrest and cup holders and everything like that and tons of storage or you can slide it back and do like a bench seat thing and slide across the front of the car to get out on the passenger side like it's just so so flexible and so open and so i totally agree with jeff completely that it just feels like loungy it doesn't it doesn't there's no sporting pretensions. It doesn't feel like you're sitting in a cockpit. It's just big, comfortable, loungy, spacious. Not everything needs to be sporty. It's, this is a good example of that. Like just, but it is sporty. That, it, that's, that's the other thing too. That's where like my mind started to change about this. When we were doing, when Brett was running instrumented testing, right. When we were out of the track, the fact that, uh, well, part of it, part of it too, is I just hadn't been dri have had not been driving the car aggressively on the roads up to that point. Right. So it kind of blew my mind that it was still in the fours in terms of acceleration, not with me not thinking about it as being like a quick EV. And when you actually do start to push it, like most EVs, it has some really pleasing handling characteristics, even if they're not great at limit track level handling characteristics. If you wanna just scoot around town and have a good time or like thrill your kids a little bit in this car, like the, especially with this setup, with big battery dual motor setup, like this car is really fun too. So, um, 
yeah, it really kind of just doesn't require a lot of sacrifices. Like it just feels right. If it's something that you can afford, if it's something that's within your price range, it just feels like a very capable all around vehicle that can kind of just, just do the thing. And that's really appealing in like a, in like a daily driver or like editor's choice kind of award where we're figuring out what car we want to bring home for two years. It's really appealing just to have something that can be comfortable, be fast, be super spacious. Just everything about it just feels very holistic and like tailored to just make your drive easier and more comfortable and more fun all at the same time. Well, let's, let's talk for just a quick moment about some of the comments that I know um, Gary Clark had one that I, uh, we should probably address your followed Ionic five and the sun shot back in my eyes, hundred yards back off the silver rear lower trim. It looked cheap. Never saw it like that before missing rear heated seats in digital rear mirror. Did any of you encounter any of that? Uh, no, I mean, that's, that's, a like that. that's a premium. That's a really premium feature that not a lot of cars have. So I'm not going to mm -hmm. like penalize it for not having that digital rear mirror is a, is a thing, you know, some people love it. Some people hate it. It would be nice to have that option. I'll agree with that. I so I just I just thought of this and I want to revise my vote and take it away from the Ionic Five because it does not have a <laughs> Too late. it does not have a We're rear windshield a wiper. It does not have a rear windshield wiper. And that is a huge annoyance. <laughs> no I'm, runoff. I'm most I'm mostly joking, but the 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 lack of a windshield wiper on the back, Hyundai, please add one. That the car would be perfect if it had that. That's the only. Doesn't it look like? Doesn't it look like it should have some sort of laser that removes the water from the rear wind, uh, yeah. window, as, as opposed to a wiper? I think I think we should start talking to our uh, some of our. I just I just want something planning. to clear the rear window because the, the 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 when I had one of these on on as a loan for a week, like it was the it was in February and it was genuinely annoying, like having to get out and like brush the snow off the back and all that stuff and sure. Yeah, it just it's not it's it's it feels like such an oversight. As as to who as to Gary's other point about the reflective rear trim, I kind of agree that that's kind of an annoying thing about a lot of cars. Like when I'm driving down when I'm driving at rush hour um, and the sun's going down and, and lights bouncing off of like the rear windshield of a car into my eyes, I hate that. But that's not really a new thing. Like cars have been doing that since the '60s. The Mercury Turnpike Cruiser is covered in chrome. Like <laughs> it's just a thing. Like. <laughs> Yes, Don't exactly. mention the car with the best name ever. <laughs> Has it's somebody just, that I, grew up with a uh, with a 1960 Cadillac convertible in the family? I can attest. The chrome <laughs> can be a little bright at times. You know, it's not a new thing, and it's not specific to the Ionic Five. You know, it's a, it's unfortunate, but unless unless we're going to paint everything Vanta black, we're just kind of stuck with it. I think <laughs> that's an option. Well, let's jump into a question here because Tom um, is with us here, State of Charge. How many of the editors voting drive pickup trucks daily? I think that's part of why they could vote for the I Ionic 5 as editor's choice. But the lighting at the best electric vehicle. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think Tom's exactly right, right? It's. Um, and it's not just us. I mean, yes, it's us voting and, and sort of in, in terms of what we want for editor's choice. But I think when we're looking at this and trying to represent kind of what the best EV versus versus editor's choice, which has a little bit more of a broad base. There's there is a reason why I think people drive more SUVs than pickup trucks most places. <laughs> Not necessarily in, in the US because frankly it's just kind of a more useful shape. It it does things that most people need to do more often. Right. So um and I, I know that that uh Tom also brought this up a little bit later, but um the fact that the lightning, he wrote that the lightning will have a bigger impact on the industry than the Ionic 5 uh, had to be considered in the best EV voting, right? So, um, and, and I think that's that's an excellent point too, right? We talked about this a little bit before. The, we, we know that the Ford Lightning is super important. We know that it's especially important right now when we're reaching, uh, or a lot of individuals are reaching their inflection points with what, be, what whether or not they're going to be able to make the, the jump to electric. With so many people buying and driving uh, pickup trucks, especially in in the U.S. and in North America, having a product that that's that is that capable, uh, that also has an electric powertrain, is is super important and makes a bigger difference overall uh, for the adoption of electric vehicles, which I think is great, positive impact. So yeah, um, yeah, it's tough. It's it. Go ahead. We we definitely had a discussion at some point about voting for Lightning for Editor's Choice, right? And it would have won three awards, which would have been amazing. And you know, I've driven Lightning. I spent a lot of time in Lightning, and I really, really love that truck more than I think I love any other truck. But it's still not something I—I I don't know if I would buy it. 
uh, just to Seth's point, like, I'm not a truck person. I don't do truck things. Like, you know, I don't need to haul a lot of stuff or tow anything. Um, and just trying to pull into a parking lot at the grocery store is still kind of annoying to me in a, in a pickup truck of that size. So to me, as far as editor's choice was where it was more personal and more of like what we would want, the Ionic 5, I think, made a lot more sense. So. So just spitballing here an idea. Can we get Jeff like some GoPros and an F-350 for a week? I did that. Or I, gave, I gave him an F-250 like a year ago. <laughs> Awful. Go, go, go cruise Miami. <laughs> um, I want to bring up something just to ask you really quick. I know we're a little bit over on time, uh, but Rodney has a really good, uh, just, just a comment here. Ionic has multiple personalities, comfortable family car, but can go when you need it to. Did any of you feel, get the impression that it was like multiple personalities or does it just kind of blend everything together really well? I, I never really got that. I mean, I think it's a multiple personalities in the sense that you can drive it like it's a hot hatchback a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but that you can also treat it like a, a family. It, it really strikes me as like a car that, um, that we don't really see very often in, in America. You, you look at like Europe and you can see like, you know, C segment hatchbacks as family vehicles. And the, the Ionic feels about as close as the American market will get to that, where people will seriously consider this, as a vehicle to carry, you know, two adults and two kids and do all of the things and still kind of have that form factor and not have like a crazy ride height, um, but still be quite fun to drive. Uh, so I, I, I don't think I really got, you know, multiple personalities, but like I, it was more because I got like a very balanced sense from, from what this car was. Yeah. I think that's like kind of kind of what he's going for. Not that it like goes from, you know, totally docile pussycat to ripping your face off. But just that it, it can do most of the things that you want it to do on any given any given week, you know, kind of just can handle a, a variety of tasks. One other, there's kind of a fun little argument going on on YouTube right now about the uh, the Lightning being in its own class of EVs until the Silverado EV comes out, which is uh, funny. I do just want to want to throw it out there into the universe. Rivian's that, just standing there, like, "Am I nothing to you?" <laughs> I, I just would like to throw it out there in the well, universe. Tom has you one. would love to test a Silverado EV, a Lightning, and a Rivian all at the same time, perhaps in a straight line, perhaps going as quickly as possible, perhaps on dirt. So let's just throw that out there in the universe and see if we can make that happen <laughs> next year. We can, we can try and do that. Hey, uh, Super Producer Kyle brought up a really interesting point too as we're talking about the dual nature, the potential dual nature of the Ionic 5, right? There is, um, and, and maybe... Uh, Bruce or Smith, who, who have covered this news a little bit more closely, can speak to it. But um, we do have an N version. We were, we were just like falling all over ourselves praising Hyundai N, right? So we've got an N version of Ionic 5 coming too, which will probably be smoking hot, <laughs> should we say? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be it's perfect. Gonna be so it's going to be perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's expected to basically be Hyundai's version of the Kia EV6 GT, possibly with a little bit more power. Um Hyundai just recently, I think, did their first official kind of teaser uh, flash image of it that we're seeing here on the screen right now. Um, I believe, Bruce, do you do you recall when that's supposed to come out or if they've even listed a date yet? It's it's slipping my memory here. Oh, man, I believe that I'm fairly confident it's going to debut next year. I would guess in the first half of the year, but you kind of yeah. put me on the spot. I don't know exact dates. Sorry, I, I will. I will bet money that one of us will end up in Korea driving that car in the next six months. Oh, yeah. That seems that, that feels safe. That feels safe. And I'm going to campaign that it should be me at this point. Our, <laughs> our producer, um, who is kind of a Hyundai, a, a, a newfound Hyundai and fanboy, says that there probably isn't, there isn't a date yet as far as, as far as we know, nothing official. So still waiting. And yeah, it, right. I mean, nothing it, official, it, but yeah. kind of the information we have first half of next yep. year. If, if there are teasers, right. out, if there are teasers out, the clock is ticking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now that we have some official visual teasers, that usually means we're getting pretty darn close and that should be, yeah, that should be, I'm excited to see that vehicle. I I'm excited with the Kia EV6 GT. So, um, loving, loving what's going on with Hyundai. I really want to see what they do with that. And Hey, Ionic six N I mean, it's sort of kind of been teased. Probably we'll, on we'll, its we'll, way we'll as well. Coming there. Yeah. They, they uh, got to get great electric first. 
Are, are we previewing the 2023 motor1.com Star Awards right now? Oh my God. You got, the, <laughs> these guys, <laughs> Seth, 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 Brett, and Jeff have heard me talking about this, but I've been like, the entire time that we were out there, I kept on thinking of vehicles like, oh shit, we're going to have one of those here next year too. And it just, <laughs> it was just, it's, it's like, I've already got probably 30 vehicles in mind. Like that would that'll probably contend. Brandon, in stop. Capacity Just give yourself year. a month. Yeah. Give yourself breathe, a month. Breathe, right? Just not breathe. think about Star Wars. But I that's I mean much, that's a good point though. Let's get through Christmas. <laughs> yeah, because because planning for 2023 starts in January. We take this really seriously, right. guys. Any last thoughts here before we uh before we bid adieu to the 2022 Star Awards? Uh, well, I just want to say again, like, first of all, I want to say congratulations to Hyundai. I think that we, we've we uh, hopefully expressed it pretty clearly. We've seen a lot of like feedback from from our commenters here. And I imagine that we'll have more after the fact when mm -hmm. uh, when when we're not live and this is published. You guys can go back and look at this on YouTube and let us know whether you thought we were right or wrong. But um, I think I think if, if we say nothing else. Uh, we know that Hyundai has done a phenomenal job. They've uh, uh, built an incredibly compelling product all the way from, you know, the bones of it, like we said, from the, the tech inside of it to obviously a very eye-catching design that, that uh, really, really gets people interested in it right away. So I'm extremely excited uh, to be able to announce this tonight, to be able to say that Ionic 5 is our editor's choice winner. I think it's the right car this year, um, and I'm, I'm really happy that they were able to participate and take home the trophy. So, um, yeah, great time. Great time overall. Yeah, congratulations, Hyundai. Um, a quick shout out. If you didn't get quite enough of us talking about all of this stuff tonight, tomorrow, Rambling About Cars, the podcast airs yeah. 9 a.m. It drops on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, all kinds of streaming platforms. You've got Bruce and me talking with Jeff and Brett, and we're going over all of the Star Awards winners, including the Ionic 5. So, gentlemen, it's been a true, genuine pleasure. Thanks for all the commenters out there that have tuned in that are joining us on this and can't wait to do it next year. We want to say thanks time. one more time to our, to our sponsor, our sponsor. And GV tires as well. Thank you guys so much for uh, helping to power star awards this year. And Hey, let us know you guys, somebody help me. My, my, I, I didn't complain about it yet, but it's actually almost three 20 in the morning where I am right now in Spain. Uh, so let's go through the list of, of the cars that we talked about again, and you guys can vote if you're, again, seeing this after the fact or want to comment right now of the five cars we talked about tonight, which would have been your pick for editor's choice. So Acura Integra, Audi RS3, Hyundai Elantra N, Cadillac CT5 Blackwing, CT5 V Blackwing, and the Hyundai Ionic 5. Yes. Comment. Let us know. And if, if you don't like any of those, there are 15 other ones you can go out and look <laughs> up and tell us why we were wrong and then why they should have been here. Gary's so, voting Hyundai early. We got, we've got one, but he's not telling us which Hyundai. That's the problem, Gary. It could, could be a Jenny. There's, the there's more than one on the list. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Very good. Good night, everybody. We appreciate you. Thanks all. Have a great night. Good night. <laughs>